next speaker I would like to uh, invite is Miriam Al Muchapa. Um, she's she's a nurse and she had an MPH degree. Uh, her work focused on understanding the social economic factor and intervention to improve the health of women living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And today she's going to share with us her study evaluating the relationship between stigma and the ability or the inhibition to sell disclosure of their status with HIV. Please. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. This is my very first time uh, presenting orally at a conference, so it's pretty exciting. Um, but I'm most excited to share uh, with you my findings um, on this analysis uh, that is between HIV, different types of HIV stigmas with different types of HIV disclosures among young women um, in Rwanda and Tanzania. So before I delve um, into the study, I would like to um, tell you about how I became interested in HIV disclosure, uh, especially among women. So back um, years ago, when I was working in Nigeria as a nurse, as a young nurse in a hospital, um, at that time, the protocol we were using in that hospital was every woman that came into the hospital that was living with HIV would go through a cesarean section and we would advise her to bottle feed her baby. We did not even give women the option to breastfeed their babies because we wanted to evaluate the risk of um, HIV transmission from the mother to the child. But then a certain woman came in um, and she decided she was going to breastfeed her baby. And we could not dissuade her from, from that decision. But what we found out later on was that she had not disclosed her status to her husband and her family members as well. So this incident um, informed the topic for my master's dissertation. Um, so as a master's student, I conducted a scope and review that, exam that explored the socioeconomic and cultural factors that affect uh, women's choice and um, infant feeding practice in the context of HIV um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And among the findings from that um, um, research was that self-disclosure was very important, um, such that women who are able to disclose their status to their partners uh, and family members were more likely to adhere to a recommended um, infant feeding practice, whereas those who were not able to disclose um, found it challenging to adhere to a recommended infant feeding practice. Um, and non-disclosure was frequently associated with HIV-related stigma. So I'm going to define these two concepts, um, HIV disclosure and HIV stigma, before I talk to you about the analyses uh, we conducted and the findings uh, from that analysis. So HIV disclosure occurs when a person living with HIV willingly informs another person about their HIV status. So why is HIV status important um, in terms of HIV outcomes? So on this slide, I'm going to talk about um, the, impo you know, the, the effect of HIV disclosure and non-disclosure on HIV outcomes. So we as researchers and care providers for people living with HIV, basically what we're trying to do is prevent new HIV infections, um, and then for people that are already living with HIV, we're trying to prevent, we're trying to improve their treatment outcomes as well as their mental health status so that they can live um, successfully and positively um, with HIV. And a lot of studies have shown that self-disclosure is frequently associated with um, improve, improvement um, of these HIV outcomes. Um, such that, for example, in the context of a woman living with HIV, uh, if she's able to disclose her status to her partner, that becomes a mechanism to talk about safe sexual practices, uh, the use of PrEP, and even if she's virally suppressed, such that the risk of transmitting the virus to her partner is zero, um, that disclosure gives uh, provides an opportunity to um, get social support that she needs to continue adhering to her medication, thereby improving her HIV treatment outcomes, and that social support um, would also can improve her mental health status because then she's able to freely talk about 
her challenges living with HIV. Um, she doesn't have to conceal taking her drugs or her clinic appointments. Whereas on the other hand, non-disclosure has frequently been shown to be associated with non-improvement um, of these outcomes. So now I'm going to talk about HIV-related stigma. So stigma has been defined as negative attitudes and beliefs about people uh, living with HIV. And there are different types of stigmas, but I'm only going to talk about three types of stigmas that are relevant to, to the study that I'm going to present. Um, so the first is anticipated stigma. And anticipated stigma is when people living with HIV are concerned about um, disclosing their HIV status to, to other people because they feel that when they do that, they become vulnerable to um, HIV-related discrimination. Um, and then the second stigma type is perceived stigma, and this is when this is the when people this is the level of stigma in the community in which HIV, people living with HIV believe exist in their community. And then experience stigma is when people living with HIV are aware that they've been discriminated against because of their HIV status. So now talking about um, the study and my the analyses and results. So what we actually did is we conducted a secondary analysis of data that emanated from two parallel studies that assessed HIV stigma scale adaptation. And these studies were conducted in East Africa in two countries, namely Tanzania and Rwanda, among women um, 18 to 24 years old in 2021, and Professor Michael Ralph is the PI of both studies. And these studies were um, sponsored, were funded by the NIH and Duke CIFAR. So this is the slide describing our analysis. We conducted logistic regression models. So we have uh, three disclosure outcomes, namely partner disclosure, family disclosure, and friend disclosure. And we have three um, stigma predictors, namely anticipated stigma, perceived stigma, and experienced st stigma. So our disclosure outcomes were dichotomous variables, such that participants were asked, have you disclosed, disclosed your status to your sexual partner? And the response options were yes or no. Um, and the same options uh, were applicable to the other type of disclosures as well. Um, and then for our stigma predictors were continuous variables, um, that um, were on a scale of one to 100, with 100 being the highest level of stigma. Um, so for each uh, disclosure outcome, we conducted three models, um, and each of these models had one type of stigma as a predictor in that model. And we controlled for social demographic factors and psychosocial factors such as depression, self-esteem, and coping self-efficacy. So our findings indicated that um, out of the three types of stigmas, it was only anticipated stigma that was statistically significantly associated with decreased likelihood for all disclosure types, partner, family, and friend. So I'm just going to demonstrate, um, talk about like the statistics with just an example with the partner disclosure. So. Um, Bearing in mind that the stigma scale is from one to a hundred, um, so for for each one point increase in anticipated stigma, a woman um, had a zero point nine eight decrease odds of disclosing her status to her partner, and this association was statistically significant. Um, and similar findings with um, the associations between anticipated stigma and the two other type of disclosures as well. <clears throat> Whereas for perceived stigma, um, the decreased odds of disclosure was only statistically associated with um, disclosure to a family member. So this is the adjusted odds ratio and the p-value. Um, whereas for experience, experience stigma was not associated with disclosure to any, to any group. So our conclusion is that considering anticipated stigma was associated with decreased likelihood for disclosure to partners, family members, and friends uh, to promote positive living among young women with HIV, uh, we should try to prioritize program and research interventions to target anticipated stigma in this, um, 
population. So that is all I have. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope um, you found what I shared with you useful. Thank you very much. We do have time for a couple questions. Really fantastic presentation. Um, so it, it was interesting. I think if I understood your final uh, your final results slide, that um, women who had anticipated stigma um, that was associated with non disclosure, but having experienced stigma was not. So, do you have thoughts on why someone who had experienced stigma may not um, have an association with disclosure, um, but someone who anticipates what that experience may be would be more likely to not disclose. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on those differences? Yeah, okay, so I just wanna say again, like um, the anticipated stigma was associated with likelihood to not disclose, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think what's really kind of what's going on in the sample is that um, probably the anticipation I'm going to add perception of stigma, even though you don't. I think the anticipation of and perception of stigma is most probably overrated. Um, and so you find that people, um, I, I think even though people, the people that experience stigma, um, it might not be to the degree that they feel that they don't want to disclose to somebody else. Um, so that's what I'm thinking is happening here. But because it's a cross-sectional study, you know, it's difficult to say which comes bef before which, um, which preceded which, whether it's the experience of stigma, whether it's the experience of stigma that is causing people um, to, to, I don't, I, I wouldn't say experience of stigma will cause people to disclose, but um, it's also possible that um, people anticipate stigma like the anticipation is really more than what is the reality. I hope that answers. <laughs> Along the same line, um, question is, this is study done in children, in young, young female and very young adults. So the question is whether the lack of knowledge and education uh, play in a role. And my question would be, uh, A, whether the findings differ uh, from other population like more more old population, older population, and B, what type of intervention do you think is needed uh, in this particular setting? Mm -hmm. How do you intervene to, to improve that uh, reduced anticipated stigma? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this finding is from um, women 18 to 24 years old. Um, and so this is a subset from a larger data set. So even when we analyze the data set with older population, we still found anticipated stigma is still associated with all the three types of disclosures. Um, so that's the first question. And the second question you said- Intervention, oh, what type of intervention? Kind of intervention yeah. too. Okay, so I think behavioral interventions uh, to target anticipated stigma, um, you know, but I'm also thinking, you know, we might, whether, I'm not sure whether we would want to just target the women or it should, should be a group, kind of a group um, intervention, that's uh, something to kind of explore uh, because it's very possible that the women, like there, there can be some internal factors like so psychosocial factors and that's why we controlled for psychosocial factors, depression, self-esteem, uh, because um, even if you anticipate stigma but then you have self-esteem and you, you know, you're able to kind of overcome some personal challenges that might encourage disclosure. So maybe interventions to kind of build the self-esteem of these women. So even when they anticipate disclosure, um, but they believe it's good for their health, they're still able to go ahead and, and disclose. And another way is if it's uh, gonna be like um, a community intervention or a family intervention so that the anticipation and perception of stigma kind of reduces, like if the stigma in the society reduces, I believe the anticipation and perception of stigma would reduce, it might not reduce to the level that it's in the community, but it might come down to be closer to par, and that could um, encourage disclosure. Thank you very much.